Yeah. <laughs> All right, here we are with Star Wars Fellowship Pitch Black Season 2, Episode 3. We are in November 2021, and listen, listeners, okay, look, I know this episode sounds like it's super out of order, that's because it is. This was a placeholder we filled out in the file to describe the Zelda dungeon that's going to show up next session. I'm almost certain me from months ago talked about it in the last episode you listened to. So this is that episode. It's months later. We uh, we kind of halfway throughout the Zelda dungeon through the session and did a, something a little different. So this episode's going to be a little different. We're going to talk about the Zelda dungeon. <laughs> We're going to talk about characters, and we just talk about season two in general. You know, that's the the format. So I'm Devin, and we'll just we'll just do names. We'll just do names. I'm Stephanie. Peter. Ian. Holden. All right. Excellent. Okay. So. Let's talk the Zelda dungeon. So in Fellowship, you have these things called set pieces. Set pieces are these pre-constructed series of threats and rules that allow you to run through common things like escape a burning building, uh, do the wacky races, uh, go to jail. I'm sure that's one of them. I'm sure I've read that. The Zelda dungeon the is exactly... Contest. Yeah, pie-eating contest. The Zelda dungeon <laughs> is a set piece meant to emulate doing a dungeon in The Legend of Zelda. It is literally that. It shows up in book four under set pieces. Um, and it's a modular set piece. So how set pieces usually work in fellowship is they have like three or two sections to them. And those sections have like a few threats. And as you move through those threats, you move on to the next section, kind of like a phased boss battle, which is sort of what set pieces can represent. If you don't have a traditional boss, like an overlord, you can be like, you know, the, this dragon is a set piece. Zelda Dungeon is built a bit different. It has parts that you swap out and change depending on the player's choices, and you kind of map the whole thing out ahead of time with the players participating. Um, you could do this mid-session, but because re-record, that just isn't how it works. Um, but if you're around the table not recording with the spotlight not on you, you guys could just print out the Zelda Dungeon on some paper and hand it out to people and dick around, fill it all out, you know, do all the kind of nailing down the important bits and then just dive into it into play. Or you could do it as you go through the rooms uh, in the dungeon and kind of define them, you know, emergently. So Zelda Dungeon is a th four phase set piece. The first phase has you building the map. So you build a number of rooms equal to the people in your game, um, and they're going to define aspects of it. So each room has two exits. One is always sealed because once you go through the first set of rooms that each player built out, you do a mini boss battle like in Zelda, like a sub boss battle. And that gets you access to the boss key and the boss chest, which has the unique item or the unique skill or the unique thing in the dungeon that allows you to solve the other half of it. Again, if you've played Zelda, you know this shit. So... Uh, after the key, you do another round of dungeons whose entrances and access points are in the rooms you described previously, and these are just an extra room. So it also has that Metroid Castlevania feel of getting to backtrack with a new item or a new key card, which is all it really amounts to in like Metroid with the different guns and missiles to get into areas. Um, but that's phase one. Phase two is doing the backtracking to the other rooms, at which the end of it, you get to phase three where there's a boss fight. And the boss fight for phase three is you pick a threat from the fellowship book. You add in three more unique rules to it that basically make it indestructible. And the only way to defeat it is to use the key item from the dungeon to dismantle its unique invincibility and then start hammering it with its puzzle weakness that all Zelda bosses have. And then you defeat it and you've beaten the dungeon. And that goes to phase four, which is where you handle offloading the dungeon into your story and it being completed. So that's kind of the bare bones. Um, bits to it what we built out was oh god i guess i should have given these to you guys ahead of time but i'm just gonna go through it fast because i'll just <laughs> talk for this part and then we'll just move on to the the review of the game uh so for our zelda dungeon we did two sets of four rooms ish um that you'll encounter in the session and they're basically excuses to have a pre-existing rule or complication or set piece that the players have to interact with while they're going through the room and dealing with the threats inside of the room. So 
you know, you'll want to put zombies or soldiers or automaton or defenses in that section and then have something unique about it that's causing them a problem or causing them to have an issue. And the questions you ask in the Zelda dungeon section will help inform that. And I'm not going to read through all of this. It That's pointless. You're going to hear it when we play. That seems foolish. That whole episode premise wasn't probably a great idea, which is why this is the intro slash outro for season two. Uh, so yeah, guys. Quite sensibly in episode three. Yeah, well, you know, we're doing a podcast and we're professionals. And if Crit Roll can do it, we can do it. <laughs> uh, Let's sell out to Wendy's. Let's, oh yeah, let's sell it to Wendy's. You know what? Critical Role does a lot of good for the community and has a lot of really great fandoms and stuff, and they do a lot of really heartfelt v- videos. I love looking up Sam Rigel's Hot Cheeto video. It's just a great love letter to the fandom and everything Critical Role stands for. You know, Sam Rigel, Hot Cheeto. Just a great Critical Role moment. An epic moment. Anyway, so guys, we are right before the end of season two like we're about to record the last like one or two episodes where you go fight the overlord and presumably defeat it and save the day and stop everything from going wrong uh before we dive on in let's talk about the game and characters so far um does anyone have like observations or comments or things they felt worked well things that didn't work well we could talk about fellowship too which is always fine like to talk about kind of um, what we're experiencing as we're going through the game with curse we're trying to record the ending, and it's been like a month since the last recording. Yeah. Absolutely. How many sessions have we had canceled by literal ice storms now? Uh, a lot of like them. Like three, maybe? Yeah, like three or four. Like, the last time we tried to play was, two, yeah. was two-ish weeks ago, and, like, there was no heat in the unit we're in, and it was minus 40 outside. <laughs> so that, uh, you know, that was that. We didn't run the session. <laughs> Yeah, Canada keeps attempting to kill our GM. Right, <laughs> Canada's gonna try and kill all of us. Uh, fucking Vancouver, uh, where some of the other players are, has uh, is having some issues. It's having a problem. If you're in November, if you're looking back, look up what Vancouver and BC was going through in November 2021. Future listeners, hi, oh person. boy, pineapple expresses. Yeah, the pineapple express arrived, and everyone realized that uh, Seth Rogen was played out. I should also probably note that I don't listen to Critical Role, so I have no idea if that was like a modification oh, of its listeners or just talking no. horrible shit on it. You, you know what? If you just if, okay. if I feel like I feel like I'm a sincere guy. I feel like I talk about feelings and emotions. I feel a lot of things, and I feel like if the fans just looked up that really heartwarming video, Samurai Gal Hot Cheeto, they'll see exactly where I'm coming from. Yeah. You know, that's all. No need to elaborate further. It's sincere. I mean, how about it again? It can go I definitely deep. do or don't endorse what he's saying, depending on how it turns out. <laughs> so. Uh, so, yeah. Game. yeah, so and, the, the yeah, game isn't yeah. cursed so much as uh, winter hit, and we're all in relocated areas and stuff. And it's kind of kerfuckled our ability to plan and do stuff. So as you go through this season, you're going to notice us get a little looser and a little sloppier with facts and names because that's what happens when your game has like two or three weeks in between sessions. Like, like if you're doing a podcast or an actual play or just running a game and you're not really familiar with it, don't really worry about taking super good notes, which Peter always does, by the way. He always takes super good notes. But you guys don't really have to worry about it because at the end of the day with a role-playing game, the facts don't matter. Neither does the history. Like, when you go through a really fun moment in a role-playing game, it's fun in the moment, and then it creates a memory that's fun to look back on. And that's kind of the reason you're doing this right now, listeners. Like, you're playing a role-playing game to have a fun pretend theater thing with your other friends who enjoy it that's the hobby the point is to make good memories if four weeks go by between two sessions and your notes are like "Ah, i'm a little fuzzy in all the details don't fucking worry about it just move on just go forward make up new details make up new facts no one's gonna care we record this for fans who like listening to it and like tell us that they enjoy what we do they do not care when we start getting things super fucking wrong because A month went by, and there was a couple blizzards and emergencies, and our brains all soupy from the pandemic. You don't really have to look forward in the future to 
look forward in the future to us almost running two different scenes of landing on the same planet. Right? Because we forgot we already <laughs> did it. It keeps happening. <laughs> Well, don't worry. Um, our fans even like our Lord of Ipsum episode and Garfield minus Garfield, so... Yeah. So, speaking of Fellowship and the Zelda dungeon, the thing that stood out to me about th- that whole uh, encounter and about Fellowship in general, particularly now that Book 4 is out, is that well, they were good sessions, and uh, I enjoyed them. The, the strange thing is that, like, the farther Fellowship gets from the basic like Dungeon Adventures template, the better its structure tends to work. Like the less you are married to the long journey being like a physical journey, or the set piece being like an actual dungeon or um, scripted encounter. Um, And it seemed like the Zelda dungeon kind of highlighted some of um, the ways in which its old core designs uh, don't take complete um, advantage of all the things the system can do. Mm -hmm. Like, I think Vel, the creator, has talked about this a lot. And it's just like an open fact. Uh, Fellowship has its DNA from like Dungeon World and the inverse world work that originally kind of came from Dungeon World. And Fellowship is sort of like a natural evolution of that. Even Book 2 has the inverse world stuff loaded into it because inverse world was really interesting. But uh, yeah, like the, the Dungeon World DNA at this point is holding back everything else about fellowship you know other people were doing reviews on twitter like another podcast or another like rpg reviewer people like did a whole like look at it and they came to a lot of the same conclusions that the the framework that fellowship is putting out like guides people through the type of narrative the shows fellowship emulates does like it does shira it does steven universe it does those kinds of payoffs and like all the rules are meant to kind of put you down on that track if that's what you want out of it and the things that get weird are the things that are like overly focused on combat or the physicality of violence, which just draws itself from Dungeon World and Apocalypse World too, because Apocalypse World was a violent that's, game. That was the whole point. That's, I think, what was jumping out at me tonight. Um, <laughs> just thinking back to the Zelda dungeon, how we sort of tended to just be like, uh, here's a new room, what's in it? Well, it's a monster, it's a trap, you know, it's, it's something, it's a physical uh, conflict. But then you look at some of the threats in uh, the latest book, and they've got much more, much more interesting and abstract uses of the threat template there. And we just weren't really uh, l- even looking in that direction. We were like, "Well, what's in this room?" It's like, "Well, yeah. it has to be something that we can confront directly." Well, it's like, "No, really." The the frame the Okay, I'm misapplying the word framework in the Tokana system. Um, the structure, the structure of the system is set up to be like, well, this room is partially collapsed, and you're going to need to do something about that to proceed. Is absolutely coherent as a threat, and something the system can process. And we weren't really thinking about doing any of that. Yeah, it's one of those um, things that becomes obvious once you see it and you go oh yeah 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 that's what it wants like we could do we could have been we could have done well you know there's power off to the section we're going to need to restore it and that's the threat or we get in here and something touches off an argument among the group and that's the threat you know yeah like one of the threats in the the book four and, and not a set piece just like a threat like the same thing like a goblin with a knife that's the way the mechanics treat it is called journey to the moon like the nasa lunar lander project is a threat in fellowship not a big set piece just a little threat that has the the the, the narrative like circumstances of its fiction are how you clear out those stats and damage them and they tell you what the the consequences and the costs are of them it just keeps further highlighting that fellowship like has this extremely 
like emergent kind of naturally occurring thing where it's threat set pieces and like main conflict driving mechanics are basically a programming language. If you just grab like moves and abilities and threats and set pieces and plug them into uh, your plan for a session, almost without you having to do any work, it builds the session for you and devotes time evenly among players and proficiencies. Uh, I think one of the things I mentioned this week is um, I feel like if there was like a revised edition of Fellowship, like a, a sort of, you know, a couple years down the road, everything's kind of redone over with like the, the last bits of the, the old text like cut out of it. Um, I would love to see frameworks having a sort of like not point by, but like a like a point list, I guess. Yeah, I guess like point by almost like Warhammer 40k, where it's like I buy my Space Marine assault squad, I get them bolters, I give them jump packs. One of them's a psyker for building out threats in an encounter. Like if the Overlord or the framework had some sort of currency or juice or resource they spent to bring threats in, which is which is what the Nemesis does actually. The Nemesis has an entire move custom move playlist around um bringing in threats that the empire or the overlord have access to and subverting them for their own uses i feel like if that was there you just start writing sessions by just using component parts of the books to be like here's this threat here's this threat here's what you'll encounter next boom 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 how do you proceed how does it look yeah at this point i think the worst part of fellowship is um the labeling on the best parts of fellowship. Um, the fact that like the gear, uh, is the fact that it's called gear, um, obfuscates so many of the amazing things you can do with that system. Like in the, uh, in the core book, the orc has, uh, one of the pieces of gear you can get for it that is just that you are stupendously strong and you're strong enough to just solve a problem by applying main force to it. Mm-hmm. That that's not a, that's not a piece of equipment, but you know what the game means by this is your gear is just this is a narrative solution that you can apply X times until you do a long rest and recharge it. So it doesn't need to be a, a piece of technology. It doesn't need to be a magic item. It's any. It can be anything that makes sense to have limited advents in the story over a certain span of time. Mm-hmm. And the same thing for the long journey. The long journey is a format that's incredibly useful for so many things that are not actually the characters going from A to B. Mm-hmm. Like... Um, uh, the, the damn threat, the threats themselves, uh, as you said, you know, the lunar space group, all the threat means is that this is a, a thing that's stopping you from, uh, that's stopping you from proceeding and you have to do these things to get past it. And if you have special powers on your character sheet to shortcut those prescribed means of beating it, you can do that. So you know, like you're like the you know the the space program. Well, you have to amass science. The 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 moves on the threat say, you know, to defeat this uh, stat, you have to amass scientists and resources and research and do all this stuff. And then the second one is you have to after you've beaten the first stat, you have to actually make a journey to the moon, do all these things. But if you've got a teleporting wizard, you can just say, well, I will just use my teleportation magic to destroy the threat. We're on the moon. Yeah. Angel Summoner style. Yeah, it pres- it's it. Fellowship is just a set of instructions on how to put together and run stories, and uh, the best thing that could happen to it would be to relabel its core parts to make it clear how flexible they really are, because That's- they're uh, absolutely amazing. It's the eternal curse of Fellowship that I keep running into, where. People mention Fellowship and how it's this genre universal applicable storytelling engine. And people go, the Lord of the Rings game. And it's like, okay, it's not the Lord of the Rings game. It's telling you how to tell these stories using a familiar touchstone that all nerds who play tabletop games know because of D&D and Lord of the Rings. And they go, but there are elves. It's clearly Lord of the Rings and hobbits. Duh. I don't think you know what you're talking about. It's like, okay, look, 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 look. The example for the elf frames them as 
space aliens. Do you think that means something? <laughs> like, this is not about the Lord of the Rings. The Lord of the Rings are just the the sort of like when you get a free when, when you start a wiki, there's default pages slugged in to show you how to make the certain types of pages. That's all the Lord of the Rings mm-hmm. stuff in Fellowship. It's giving you the signposts for these two archetypes. Two of the options that, for orcs. Two of the options for orcs make them fire elementals or living fungi. Right? Huh. Like, yeah. Uh, the ha- uh, the, the trappings air. barely matter, and the more you realize the trappings are reskinnable, it's the better it gets. Yeah, but that's the eternal. I mean, we're we're of, using of the fellowship. lantern for a fucking Jedi. Yeah, and that's what it was meant for. Exactly, the ship playbook is meant to be the ship is the extra character. The the, the Empire stuff is based off a bunch of fucking Star Wars shit. Like, there's so much in Fellowship written as text. The one of the things that was like my journey with this game across two sessions. This is my first fellowship campaign. Uh, so when I was started off, I was very concerned with like how uh, the, the, my kit in the lantern playbook, um, how it corresponded to like the Jedi uh, character that I'm playing. And I'm like, well, you know, I've got my little light and it can transform into a melee weapon that burns things so obviously i'm using that as a lightsaber but it's also got like a laser mode and jedi don't really shoot hand lasers and i don't carry a blaster so what is that well all that really means is i can is i can project threat at range Mm -hmm. so you know force pushing so i started doing force pushes i started ripping uh you know, paneling down and throwing it at people and stuff. But over time, I got just less and less and less concerned with making sure that all my Jedi bullshit mapped to the lantern. And we were just like, uh, well, I'm a Jedi, so I'll just jump really high. I'll use telekinesis. I'll do whatever. And I'm like, okay, you know, the system, uh, the system doesn't really care. The basic moves are just like, they don't care whether I've got like an arm's length reach or a spear or, you know, they're not concerned with hardly any sort of nitty gritty and the game just maps itself around whatever story you're telling very smoothly. It reminds me a lot of, and it only cares about the big narrative exceptions. Yeah. It, It reminds me a lot of Chubos actually, where, um, when you have your character, because there's like two types of Chubos characters. There's like the normal quote unquote characters and there's the supernatural ones. And that's a huge fucking misnomer because the quote unquote normal characters are like top tier exalted in what their influence is and in how Chubos tells a story. And the supernatural versions are like nobles from it, from Nobilis where they're bigger than gods because Nobilis is a weird fucking game. So like, you have shit like that on your character sheet in Chubos and in Nobilis where it's like, here's the big stuff that like defines your character. And it's like not very subdividable. It's mostly like big statements and how your powers flavor it, but you'll get subdividable powers as you go through your different arcs and stuff that like clearly represent small narrative manipulations you have, not because of like what your character has as a character, but what your character means in the story. Like the dragon also has that power where they're so strong they can like a couple times before they have to recharge instantly overcome an obstacle with overwhelming strength when strength wouldn't be able to do it. So if they have to get through a wall, they're through the wall. If they have through a door, it doesn't matter how magic that door is, they're through the door. And they have a few of those because a dragon character, depending on how you contextualize them as like an actual dragon, the last samurai, which is one of the options or like a really strong, like inheriting dragon power sorcerer kobold. You can use that power to say, because I am a dragon, obviously at certain points in the story, this character is going to show unnatural dragon strength. And like, if you're the the, the, the last samurai guy, that could just be cyberware because it's a street samurai from fucking Shadowrun. You're like, yeah, I overclock my fucking cyberware and bash my way in. I can do that a few times in the story, but not too many times where it gets boring. It, it's really a lot more writer roomy, but in a way that there's... You know, in a way that's more satisfying than fate ever was. Cause fate also gives off the writer room feel, but in a way that's isolating while also suffocating. And also like you can never, there's like a wall in front of you and to get into your character. I find a lot, but fellowship makes it feel a lot more natural to kind of slip these, um, these sort of like narrative, like, like obviousnesses these characters would have because of what they do in the story. It cuts a lot closer to the bone of how um, storytelling in, role-playing group works 
Yeah, not how they want it to work, not how they think it works, how it actually ends up working when you actually sit down. Because, listeners, if you're playing a role-playing game with like mechanics and rules and it's something like D&D or GURPS or Rifts, you're not really playing those games the way the games are quote-unquote written to be played. I'm not going to say meant, because none of these games are meant to be played, they're meant to be bought. But when you engage <laughs> with the game at the table and you're playing D&D, odds are you're not actually playing D&D the way you think you are. You're actually, like, you're following the rules by, like, lip service as best you can because they're fucking impenetrable. But you're probably doing shortcuts and concessions and, like, these smooth over things you'll see on Twitter threads with the hashtag family or whatever that, like, let you get to the good parts of the story, the parts that you love, the parts that you want to retell, the parts you heard from other people's groups that you want to have in yours. You're all kind of guiding yourselves to those if you like them, and you're already doing the things Fellowship would push you towards. It just gives you nice structure for it so you don't have to figure it out on your own and reinvent the wheel again, because the history of tabletop RPGs is reinventing the wheel that was invented in 1972 and never stopping. I don't remember what I originally got me on that tangent, but I certainly said a bunch of words. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what the conclusion to that sentence is. I just took a bunch of pot shots across, across the bow. Well, it has something to do with fellowship, you know, having those frameworks and just being hard to discover those. Like for the last episode that we're doing right now, you're inventing this cool set piece, those scenes or whatever, like, oh, this is a long journey. Whoops. Yeah. I wanted to do a thing where, like, we... And you'll see this in the finale, listeners, where, like, you, you approach each group of NPCs and kind of see what they would have done in the final conflict, but doing it kind of, like, ro round robin style. And, like, I'm like, oh, shit, this is just a long journey. <laughs> like, it's just, you know, hey, we do a scene and then a scene and then a scene. At the end of it, you're at the boss, and that's how I was kind of mapping it out. I'm like, oh, Fellowship is already doing the thing. But, like... To, to talk about moves and kits and narrative power, like, I'm looking at the Lantern core and the Lantern. They get three moves for their core. One is they have their little Lantern light. It's a light, it's a ball, it sticks close to you, and it can do stuff. Like, it can point stuff out to you, it can highlight things in the environment, it can convey information to you that you might know. Or might not notice. And, like, you could say that it's, like, a literal light from a lantern shining on, like, a clue. You can say it's, like, an interface in, like, an old point-and-click adventure game where, like, if you hover your mouse over something, it gets an outline, you're like, oh, I should click that. Or it could be Jedi getting a fucking hunch about something when they and get their attention drawn to a thing because they get a premonition or just a gut feeling, like how the Force is. That's just a core thing the lantern does. It, it doesn't need to be detailed more like fucking prophecy or, like... You know, being able to, like, uh, um, meditate for a while and do a bunch of shit. It's just an innate thing this type of character has. The other two powers are Bend Light, which gives you, like, a little checklist of cool tricks you can do. And then you have to recharge them. And they're, you know, making a bridge across an area. But that bridge is abstract. It doesn't have to be a physical bridge. It could be something as simple as, like, holding a door open so people can get under it. And that's the bridge. You know, it holds as long as it needs to before the door slams down and he grabs his hat. You could do stuff like a flashbang, which could be you know, flavored a million different little ways or walls or shadows or conspiracies or like shadows for stealth or hiding or like putting up off you skate like vampires do. These options are there. You just have to recontextualize them for what your Jedi is supposed to look like. And the last power, which I think is the most, the biggest is reveal the way, which covers everything Jedi do in star Wars that has to do with them being charming. It's just, you tell someone what's best for them. You have to mean it. And if they listen, you make a role and that, you know, changes how things go based on how well you do and if they listen. And if they do listen, they get a bunch of bonuses for taking your advice. So if you tell someone, you know, hey, you know, you should like turn on your friends and join us because we're the good guys and you shouldn't be a stormtrooper. The stormtrooper, you could flavor that as like maybe mind control or like being really empathetic or like you could use reveal the way on animals and have that be animal empathy like Ezra from Rebels does and make it work. And it'll actually like push that along and it supplements stuff and that, that move supplements stuff like talk sense or um, speak softly. It's just an extra tool they get. And then there's a bunch of things the lantern can buy later that modifies these three moves and changes the context again for like an obvious thing a Jedi would have. Like there's a mind trick power and obviously Obi-Wan can do that. He can just fucking trick people, but he doesn't have to use mind trick or reveal the way he could do that from other, like for other things if they're not applicable. It's very 
spread out and very non-specific how you can kind of represent your character and fellowship in these different genres, in these different stories, in these different archetypes. So like, yeah, if someone's, if you want to play like Star Wars, Star Trek, even Transformers, Avatar, um, anything that has that kind of like, I don't know how to describe the pacing. I call it YA fiction and it's really not, but you can sort of tell the stories that fellowship would work for if there's like an ensemble cast and it matters that they build meaningful relationships and it matters the people that they interact with are recurring and come back and can like, you know, you can show how their lives have improved by interacting with the heroes. Um, the game supports those types of shows, movies, books, comics, stories, video games, whatever you want to kind of pull from that's popular now. It, it does those things regardless of genre. And regardless of like, this is a game where when we played Transformers, Peter played one of those big Transformers. Like, I don't want to get into the specific terms, but you know Metroplex, who's like 700 meters tall, and everyone else is like not that. They're like a little more within the same size range. Fellowship lets you play that character, and it doesn't break, quote unquote, break the game. It doesn't, you know, become impossible to play because one character's 50 meters tall and one character's 800 meters tall. The game will just do it. It doesn't care about those types of specific things. It cares if that character that's 700 meters tall has friends and family and feelings and things that can be leveraged and damaged to like throw its emotional and mental state into disarray. The game cares a lot about that stuff. I think that's the end of my little like thing about that. I mean, it kind of did care about this. Uh, that's why we don't have the giant anymore. We have the ogre now. That, that's not apparently the... it was kind of hard that, that, when that's some not... person is that's not that's not actually it because you can you, you you can just be big in fellowship the giant was reconstructed for that reason and a bunch of other ones including that for a powerful playbook it really it, it was one of the first powerful playbooks i think it might have been the first and for what it was giving you as a powerful playbook it really wasn't like doing the work it didn't have as many interesting kind of like options or ways to kind of grow and change the way the others did it, it suffered a lot for being the first new playbook and the first powerful playbook being published after the core came out before the second edition happened. So like Vel basically saw that you could keep most of the flavor of the giant and strip out the big giantness and some of the more simple loops and put that over into something else and make this a normal playbook that can interact with everyone um, without having to sacrifice anything. Like it's a little bit that, yeah, being 500 meters can be tricky, but I feel like that was the weakest of the things that need to be fixed. Cause again, it didn't really influence our game that you were big. You still were on the scene and you were still taking action all the time. Well, like, yeah. yeah, sure. There's a building that's too small for you to go into. You were still outside the building, talking in through the windows, talking over comms and taking action. The, the heroes would be getting into a fist fight with like people sized Decepticons. And you were 10 feet, a hundred thousand feet tall doing the big guy stuff, changing the environment and like holding off shit. It, yes. it wasn't a huge hurdle. I mean, yeah, so basically kind of work, but you know, apparently the problem is when someone's on the side of the mountain and the session wants to be inside the submarine. It's like, hmm. But yeah, I get that. Yeah, like, this is, I feel like even if the giant, even if the ogre was still like hundreds of feet tall or whatever, like, you, you could make those sessions work just fine. Like, you could in Fellowship because Fellowship doesn't care. <laughs> about you being up the size of a mountain and everyone's in a submarine, you can find ways to make that work pretty easily without even diving into like playbook custom abilities. To be like, oh, more to the, the point, it doesn't more to the point. It doesn't care when combat breaks out that he's a hundred thousand feet tall. And you know, everyone else is like regular sized for whatever the setting considers regular. Yeah. Uh, it cares about how much narrative impact and what kind of impact the character has, mm -hmm. which includes being able to do anything that a person who's a hundred thousand feet tall would logically be able to do or not able to do. Yeah. Absolutely. It just naturally shapes itself around the conditions in the story. Mm hmm. So yeah, uh, I guess that's just an easy way. I, I guess like the whole kind of thing we're, we're gunning towards here is that Fellowship is really flexible uh, and it's still a game we're still discovering new things about and still are pretty happy with. Like I know we've run a bunch of Fellowship. Like I just did four seasons worth in a year in a row simultaneously. But like I'm excited after a bit of a break uh, just because things are all dicey because it's, it's 2021 listeners, you guys know. 
Uh, but I'm excited in, in, you know, some months down the line to come back to fellowship with all the things I've learned about and all the things I've thought about and all the stuff that's kind of stewed in my mind and kind of do another game. doesn't matter what, maybe something that isn't a, an already existing IP this time. Cause I, I really want us to use command lore more. And I know that there wouldn't have been a problem doing it more in star Wars. I just feel like it'd be easier to get people on board with it. If we did something that was totally original instead of, uh, tapping into a pre-existing property to get rid of that uh, that sense of hesitancy. Definitely. Um, it, if I'm, if this point, if I ever ran uh, one thing, a, a group of friends of mine uh, constantly wants to do, and we never get around to it is running like a final fantasy campaign. Mm-hmm. Uh, fellowship would be what I would use for it. And this is the thing I would I would say to anybody like looking at fellowship and looking to run something with it. Uh, I would I would use fellowship and I would basically use no modifications whatsoever. Absolutely, to the system. I would not try to join up a custom playbook or custom moves. I don't think I need them. It's all there. Um, like the stuff even- that is there can be. It, it's incredibly reskinnable. Don't be tied down to the notion that the orc needs to represent an orc or even anything particularly monstrous. It's just something tough. Yeah. Uh, or orcs can also just be in fellowship. That type of girl they have in animes that's in like a punk uniform and is like a bad girl. Like they're 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 angry and they're fist fighty. It's called like Senran Banco. No, it's called like something or other. I don't know the term for it. But that's the orc. <laughs> Oh, and the ogre is the sundry playbook. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. The ogre is not Straight only the up. sundry playbook; it is also the Shrek playbook, which is just—it's a lot. It's a lot that 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 those two things were combined. It just tilts you. Ah, so we have, we have sundry Shrek. Okay, right. Somebody once There's told absolutely you. nothing stopping you from running the ogre as a wizard. Put it that way. Yeah, there was nothing stopping you. It's not immediately obvious, but I'm saying if I had one piece of advice to give about the game, it would be just keep in mind that you can you can flex the you can flex almost anything in here as almost anything, and it will it will not feel awkward. It will not feel like it does in a friggin' hero system. Where you're like, well, uh, I'm playing Iceman, and I'll just use like the D6 energy blast for my ice beams that Cyclops <sighs> is also using for his I beams, and it feels fake as shit. It doesn't feel fake as shit. Yeah, you uh, like, think it would, but it never does. To give a Star Wars example, everyone loves, or I guess, I guess people over thirty love the Force Unleashed games. Because I remember those being popular when I was a teen. Like, people were fucking losing their shit over the main character with his cool-ass lightsabers, and he has power armor, and he's Vader's secret apprentice, and he can pull Star Destroyers down with his mind. That's the Ogre playbook. Or the Harbinger. Like, you like without changing a single fucking rule, you can play the Force Unleashed protagonist in Fellowship. It's not out of bounds. <laughs> or someone's uh, particularly affectionate pet Rancor. They will both run off the same playbook equally well. Well, to Final Fantasy you, because I think about Final Fantasy all the time, um, if you wanted to play like a blue mage, like a wizard that, like like a mage that gets hit by a monster special attack and then has it from then on, um, the collector playbook. The collector playbook is all about like amassing a collection that's easily reskinnable to, yeah, I got hit by his fire blast and like mechanically you didn't take damage or anything. You're just using your collector stuff. And now I have a copy of that on hand. Like I can do that sometimes. Oh yeah, that's a great idea. Right? Yeah, oh, absolutely. All right, Steph, you play the Final Fantasy That would Fantasy be super too, cool. Oh yeah, absolutely. Oh, thank God. All right, perfect. It's good when multiple people know the things we're talking about, because I, I don't know anything about the Final Fantasy MMO. Like, I still think Mithra are in it. Last I checked. So Wait, what's a Mithra? There it is. The Perfect. Makote, but from Final Fantasy XI. So, oh. okay. They're not just cat girls from Final Fantasy XI. They're like jazzer-sized cat girls. It's, my, it's the funniest fucking thing in the world. Okay, if you go to the character creation screen in Final Fantasy XI, each race oh God. and I think gender has their own soundtrack that plays. Uh, and like the little yes. halfling one is cute. The Galka one is all like serious and regal and like Imperial Marchy. 
uh, the human ones, whatever. The Mithra run is like a fucking hot yoga jazzercise track. And like the Mithra, like the three model in it. The Mithra in it, she's like doing exercise emotions. She gets down on her like her belly and like pumps her legs back and forth to show that she's working out. Like she's doing aerobics. It's amazingly shallow. Wow. Yeah, That's yeah. amazing. This is all true. Well, if it makes yeah. you feel better, there are cat girls in Final Fantasy fourteen. I hear there's bunny girls, right? They have those. Yes. Yes. And soon there will be bunny boys, too. How objectified are they on a scale of not enough to a hundred percent, which is enough? Um you're gonna see about a million bunny boys running around in, in frilly little maid outfits as soon as they're released. There uh-huh. it is. Perfect. I mean, they, they, they added power bottoms as a race. It's yes. absolutely Look, exactly. I feel bad for uh bunny monster people, but uh... That objectification level is always going to be at 100%. They have a tail and little ears. Yeah. I love that bunnies and cats get into a dominance uh, feedback loop because cats being groomed means they're in charge. No, cats grooming something means they're in charge and bunnies being groomed means the bunny's in charge. So if you get a cat and a bunny, <laughs> and the cat just keeps grooming the bunny, they both are like, yes, I'm really in charge of this situation. Which is basically Guillermo <laughs> and Nandor from what we do in the shadows. <laughs> <laughs> and they're both convinced they're in charge. Uh, so yeah, for like, for, to, to, to seize upon the Final Fantasy idea, like... You know, the playbooks in book one cover most shit from Final Fantasy. You want to be a Moogle with a sniper rifle? Take the elf playbook. It's right there. You want to be a Moogle that's slightly less threatening? The halfling playbook. You want to be those weird fucking things that eat people that are blue mages in Final Fantasy IX? There's a bunch of options for you for that, actually. It's starting with the halfling (laughs) playbook. It's like, what are these halfling pack lunches made of? Oh, this and that. We want to use the whole animal on this adventure. <laughs> <laughs> they're like uh, picking Kefka's. Cl- they're like picking Kefka's clown makeup out of the pie. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god! Uh, but yeah, um, there's a lot of tech in Fellowship that I feel is just not getting capitalized on because I don't want to say Fellowship's unpopular. It's just it's probably not being played at the frequency that. Like, okay, the way we play tabletop games, like, as a group... It is like, objectively do, not being played enough. Yeah, like, we're, we do one or two sessions a week, sometimes three or four on, like, a good year. And, like, we do it pretty hard. Like, you know, we'll knock out, like, four seasons in a year, five seasons, 50 episodes of something if we get onto it. People play D&D like that. There are still people out there that are, like, doing the weekly or the every other, like, day session where they're just fucking slamming through D&D at that frequency and catching shit. People aren't really doing that for fellowship just because it doesn't have that permeance in like uh, in the collective consciousness for tabletop games. People just don't know. And it cuts back to that original curse. I think it's the Lord of the Rings stuff. Like the game is called fellowship. The game is about relationships. The game is telling you what it cares about. And people go, the Lord of the Rings game. It's like, no, no, it, it's the, the game is named after cooperation. That should be a sign, guys. It's it's more like shown in anime. Everything is powered by the power of friendship. Yes. Like, I, I feel like uh, there's this concept we've been playing around with in tabletop games with like guys or the gang or like having the group where like the players will just kind of glomp together into like a gang. And that's been showing up a lot more in pop right. culture. Like Always Sunny has the gang. Seinfeld had the gang. There are non-villainous examples I don't have in my head right now. But if you look at media, it's there. The gang. <laughs> And, and fellowship is the ultimate the gang game you guys get together you all right. become friends you're the core group but you also have side people you're friends with that are just part of like your entourage that are like you know for those types of stories that don't focus on everyone like you could run fellowship in like an, uh, some sort of like anime-esque inspired high school drama like thing like kill a kill was and it would work and it would capitalize it on it. It runs that. One Piece and it runs the Avengers with equal ease. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's at least as good as both of those as it is at Lord of the Rings. Probably I mean, better. If you want to talk Undertale, 
like probably, what, in fact definitely better you have the ship for one piece exactly and like undertale delta rune the idea of like being kind compassionate empathetic and sparing people and solving issues without violence and cruelty that's baked into fellowship one of the ways you can kill quote unquote or destroy a threat is you is you don't use blood or violence you befriend them and spare them in capital letters yellow highlighted and they become part of your crew like they just become part of the party like magus from chrono trigger joins you because you befriended him after beating him and it's just supported by the rules I mean, and the rules even have the thing where he gets less powerful when he joins the party <laughs> because all of his that's, like that's GM... just dragon ball right well, well the chrono trigger is done by the guy who does dragon ball yeah. so like magus looks like vegeta so Fair one enough, for yeah. one it's the same character sprite <laughs> so yeah that's exactly <laughs> it but like he even becomes less powerful because the gm facing mechanics bleed off of things and they come under player control so like it's hilarious it's all there like you want people want to play Pokemon and Chrono Trigger and they go to those systems where it's like we emulate the mechanics one for one, including the computer calculator range. Don't fucking do that. Play Fellowship. Set up a set piece for a floating city called uh what was it called? Zenith or Zeal? And then how like there's fucking Zeal. Atlanteans in there yeah. and it falls apart and there's an apocalypse. Like Fellowship just does that shit, dog. The long journey is the time travel shit. <sighs> The long journey is you guys together as a crew get hired at a company. Like you go to Amazon in the game and they're like, we're going to hire all four of you together in a group. And the long journey is every stage of the hiring process before you're inside the job. Yeah. There's a lot of untapped potential that I feel will come back to you with fresher eyes and a a better mindset once we get a little bit of uh, distance from it. Yeah. So character wise, um, this will probably be the final word on the four seasons of like, there's two seasons of pitch black and two seasons of spiders and snakes. And you guys listeners haven't even gotten to spiders and snakes, but this is probably the last time I'm going to talk about the game before we get into the movie and put a pin in the whole saga. Cause everything else is recorded. So like for pitch black um, thoughts about, I don't know, characters, set pieces, plot points, interesting stuff. Any of you guys want to get out there about your characters and your stuff uh, now that I've talked a bunch? Well, my biggest problem is that we're like fishing the scene too, and just now I'm starting to f- you know round up my character, get everything I wanted, and the game's about to end. We're gonna have all my cool toys, and not enough time to you know rock havoc with them. Yeah, I hate that. That, that. That's a sucky thing, and that's just it's just how this game turned out. Like uh, this season is very truncated season one was supposed to be like 20 sessions season two was supposed to be another 20 we got seven each before we got to the to the movie so you know it sucks that you get there and then you don't get to reap the rewards of it we must be airing on fox i mean plus like or even airing our fucking episodes out of order (laughs) i mean like that's like one problem fellowship that there's a lot of like setting up especially in the early episodes where like Okay, we have five people in the fellowship. Who wants to do which Destiny playbook? So we have to earmark that in. So we're spending like five, ten sessions of everybody getting their fellowships. So you can do your final builds and then we can get to the something. I mean, so I don't. I, I'm so. I, it's like water and soap. I'm so vehemently opposed to that point of view of it because. It's like Finn and Adventure Time, where Flame Princess in the dungeon is like, we have to go all the way back to the beginning and try the new key card. And Finn's like, we get to go all the way back to the beginning and try the key card. <laughs> it's like, we get to decide what our Destiny playbooks are going to be after role-playing in-game and find out what we want our characters to take. And then we get to tell the GM what ones we're aiming for so it's written into the story. And then we get to go get them. And then we get our Destiny playbooks and we get to use our cool powers. Like, these are all bonuses for me. I mean, um, some that. parts of the system base definitely push toward expanding the story and spending more time going out and finding new communities and earning their fellowship by solving their problems and getting into their shit. But the longer you run the clock on the game, the more of a bitch the overlord uh, in battle becomes. For sure, and the more he trashes the set, and he, the more he trashes the setting that you've been developing. Yeah. Uh, so there's definitely some some tension, some cross tension there, for sure, uh, and particularly with the Overlord. Yeah, for the Overlord specifically, that's a big deal because the Horizon, there's no tension. The Empire, the Empire uh, can't technically 
really hurt the players in the same way the Overlord can. So there's less tension there. I agree. The Overlord is probably the hard setting for it. Um, but that comes down to communication. You got to talk to your players about what you're going to set the pace and the urgency for sure. Like this game, the assumption was um, the setting outside the Strait of Messina wouldn't get like totally destroyed. So like dicking around in here wouldn't mean the end of the world in the sense that if you wouldn't let it go on too long, it wouldn't be like one day Coruscant's conquered. There is an existential threat baked into how the Overlord operates where he's like, I'm trying to destroy all time and space because I'm sad. But it's not the same. It's not the same thing. That's just the Overlord being a bad. That's baked into every Overlord that they're a bad and they're doing a bad that makes you sad. But like, you have to, yeah, you have to plan that out with the group and make sure people know how to pace themselves. And like, you you hit the nail on the head. Fellowship sessions are supposed to be a lot more about gaining fellowship with communities because that's like every other episode of Avatar. They go into a town with a problem. They solve it. The community loves them forever and doesn't fry dough and throws a parade in their honor. Yeah. Like that's supposed to be a little more bread and buttery. And just, just because of how this game got structured, it didn't happen as much as it should have. Like I really had a, had, had this vision of it being a little more sprawling and a little more fleshed out for like what's going on in the Strait of Messina, what players are there, what kind of like, people work for the overlord like those those blind dinosaur monsters that show up in the next game are supposed to have been expanded on there's a planet full of rock jedi like there's a ton of shit that got cut out of this game that just we couldn't get to you know it it didn't work out that way which uh that's probably now that i'm like really looking back on it uh, a lot of the times fellowship just runs short for us is the nature of us using it as a podcast for how we structure like the game out like we we try to do a little bit of structuring and prep ahead of time just to know kind of where we're going the next week or so and then when shit starts like disrupting us we start to like you know it's like i i just want to get to the parts we were trying to get planned out i don't want to move around the setting a lot i want to kind of just move through it because we've had a lot of breaks and we're losing enthusiasm we're losing speed for it Mm -hmm. fellowship i mean paradoxically and i know i'm cutting you off sorry but paradoxically people like to say pe- people who think they know powered by the apocalypse like to say as fact that powered by the apocalypse games have very short lifespans and very short play times you can only do five or ten sessions tops before you run out of road and the whole thing falls apart and fellowship is the opposite well, they're designed for that yeah fellowship well, some of them are designed for it, and other ones are clearly designed to be just games you play weekly or games you play until you've reached a natural conclusion. And Fellowship is one of those. It has a very specific design, I feel, where you're meant to soak like 20, 30, 40 sessions into it before you really start like considering moving on. It rewards you for that because it builds in callbacks by by having the companion system where it forces you to track bonds and companions, even though we I think it's a little it could be streamlined more but you can look at your sheet 10 sessions down the road and go remember boblin the goblin from session two well he's technically a companion and we never said we picked him up so maybe he's still back in that original town let's send him a letter and have him join up or let's send him a letter and have him do what we need to do in the other town he's my companion i can take actions through him to gain advantage and solve this issue so like if the threat is you never pay taxes in the first town and you need to get advantage on the threat to finish it. You're like, Bob and the Goblin's my companion. I use Bonded and Servitude to use his stat to get advantage on the tax thing because he'll just pay the taxes because he lives there for us without us like going into like overdraft or whatever. Threat solved. And we called back a guy from like the first couple of sessions. I was just thinking that about Captain Crunch the other day. Right? Like so Captain Crunch. the fuck back in session one. I, I was thinking about her today when I was plotting out the session and stuff. Like I was going to have her like cameo show up and stuff if people didn't bring her up because we we're going to, I'm taking the movie, like the end of season two as a, as a time to go back to those NPCs and have some of them show up to like be there. Yeah. You know, have a callback happen and fellowship <laughs> wants you to do that naturally. It's in the rules. Um, but like it benefits greater from you spending more time on it and especially cycling frameworks. But I'll I'll touch on that later. What were you saying, Holm? I, I think yeah, part of the the compression issues we run into is not because uh, not because this uh, season has been bad or anything, but just because of the the nature of the fucking delays yeah. that kept hitting it. 
I think if this weren't a podcast, we would have probably just dropped and let the game dissolve. You know? Oh, absolutely. No, no, no uh, I absolutely would have done that. So instead, <laughs> so instead, it's like, okay, well, you know, Jesus Christ, uh, we're, the you know, the heat is dissipating because we keep getting delayed for three weeks at a fucking time. So we're just rushing to the end. And so that's, you know, that's changing uh, the natural tempo from what it would have been if we were getting consistent weekly sessions like we ought to have been. Yeah. I think probably we would have run into the Rock Jedi and done more stuff with the worlds in the Strait of Messina. Oh my God. Uh, Just fighting so goddamn hard just to get a session in. Sister Despondia had like five or eight other people under her thumb that you were all going to interact with. She had like a whole witch's commune of like weird fucking people. Like that was a whole section of the game that never happened. Like the whole thing dealing with Despondia was like a mini arc in season one or two where, yeah, you have witches to deal with now and you would just chew through. Now, the I remember overlords. you just like chortling over your giant lexicon of mini bosses. Yeah. yeah. Which like, you know, yeah, yeah you cut yeah. stuff. With their organization being expanded and suddenly having, you know, twice as many toys. Exactly. <laughs> I guess, like, fellowship, you know, from what I've played, yeah, it does have a time limit because, like, once you, like, hit, hit your peak or whatever, it's like, oh, okay, what do we do next? It, I guess it makes more sense to have, like, not really episodic games, but more like uh, one season, one story, then you move on in the same world. You continue something, but with new characters will have you. And maybe that makes more sense for it. Because then you have the build up, you have the callbacks, you have all the lore we've established. But you don't, you know, run to the end of the power curve and you don't just delete Dalia Lantos. The overload destroys everything. And... Yeah, it's, yeah, we've, we've uh, sp- uh, I guess, spoilers. But uh, by the end of the session, the, our characters have gotten pretty unbeatable. Yeah, pretty rough. Yeah. Um, but like, uh, you don't have to decide that shit ahead of time because Fellowship naturally does that. It has the new beginning baked into it, which just resets you to level one and lets you keep, you know, tricks from your previous adventures. But like, you could easily make the case that the new beginning is passing on the torch to someone new. Someone's apprentice becomes the master, which there's an entire Destiny playbook for, hey guys, I'm ready to retire my character. I'm going to make them into the master and they're going to get a student and then I'll become the student when the master retires. Like fellowship hard codes, the idea of doing the next generation into it. It's there. It exists. And it's an option to tap if you feel like you're done, but like it it exists and it's something that you can do to keep re uh, not renewing. What's the word evergreen, the the story and the cast and who's there, which I, I just feel that, you know, for, for just mechanics written in the book, like, Hey, these are just a normal thing. The game assumes you'll do because in normal fucking campaigns, that's just what people do. They're like, Oh no, my D and D character died. I'll play his companion or his squire or whatever they have. Right. Their horse, Cause it's a sentient right. paladin mount, whatever. Like you already do that. Yeah. But technically, <laughs> you know, being the mentor is a separate district. So if you became, I know something else, you cannot take that. And, yeah, uh, you just out. you just a new start. Like like it doesn't it, I, there's yeah. no. It's just yeah, a it, it, of the system as written that you know sure you can get around the, it and so on. But it would be nice if this like was solved in some next edition. But that's neither here nor there. And yeah, yeah. Like there's enough well, material. There's ninety percent of the scaffolding there to just make it work. Like I I never really change fellowship when I run it, and I don't think it really needs a lot of it for what. For what the the for what the common like not common what the what the common play group what the average play group who's going to pick up fellowship for the first time and what they're going to do with it you don't need to change fellowship it'll do what they want there'll be an onboarding process and you'll get out to the other side you don't have to get highly experimental or laser focused we tend to laser focus we tend to try to optimize streamline cut out the fat and get to the good parts of the sessions and the role playing. Um, and for us, we would really benefit from having a streamlined edition of Fellowship, or not even streamlined, one that's been just, I don't know, I don't know what to call it, a refresh, a retrofit, maybe, because, you know, why not? Refit it. Um, hey, guys. We have an edition just for us. Hey, guys. I got yep. cut out. So, yeah, sure. Um, um, I'm glad we got so the chance to talk, and you guys have a good night. So yeah, we'll absolutely, Steph. Then, uh... No, no, we'll just keep going. We're an hour in. This is free. It's free real estate.
Have a good one, Steph. <laughs> if she disconnects. We're an hour okay. and wait, 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 okay. Wait, Peter, wait, it was wait. wrong of me to override Peter because he said a very valid point. We have to end the recording so it uploads because I was Zencaster works. I am sorry, Peter. You are right. I'm wrong. Wait, I... <laughs> so let's end it now. <laughs> okay, we're back. We ended the file and uploaded it. And then we realized that Ian's also going to head off for the night because it's like, I don't know, it's like 11 or something. So we're just going to wrap the recap episode here. We've said all the nice things we can say about fellowship. I you couldn't have gotten this far without at least checking the PDFs at this point. It's impossible to assume you just got here randomly. You already fucking know the good stuff. Play fellowship. Yeah. Uh, Star Wars is bad. Here, here's the last, here's the last words on the game. Star Wars is bad. Uh, it's just the worst fucking thing in the world. I hate this IP. All the movies make me miserable. I don't want to hear about it. I don't want to see it. Everything about Star Wars frustrates uh, me. I have nothing but contempt for uh. it. This game was great. <laughs> uh, all the characters yeah. were great. The stories yeah. were great. Shit was fun. Fellowship is good. Narrative pacing. Blah, blah, blah. Anyone else have anything to add? Lightsaber's yeah. good. Corporate IP's bad. Yeah. Fortnite. <laughs> worst- Palpatine's back. Yeah. Somehow. But that's the worst thing. Like, yeah, I also like, get tired of Star Wars by now, but this game, these two games were actually interesting, and I wanted more of this. Right? Despite this being Star Wars. <laughs> I have nothing but contempt for Star Wars, but yeah, it's great playing Star Wars. Fucking piece of shit. <laughs> 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 Fuck you, George. You should have just kept uh... trying to make Flash Gordon. You should have never made I Star never Wars. Want to ta- I-, I never want to have anything to do with Star Wars again, unless we run more of this in yeah, which yeah, case no. I'll be a Mandalorian bounty hunter. <laughs> oh, it's going to be so fun. But yeah, I wish Star Wars never invented. It ruined art forever. Anyway, it see you all back for five. season five. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I was Devin. This was Steph. Peter. Ian. And Holden. And this is sponsored by nobody. Signing off.